This video is brought to you by the good folks at KEH. Not only is KEH the oldest and biggest at what they do, buying and selling exclusively used camera gear of all sorts since 1979, but they do it well with integrity and both a 180-day warranty and 21-day return policy, free shipping on orders of $75 or more. Which is why, because they make it as futz-free a process as possible, they are our go-to whenever we are looking to fund new purchases by selling our own gear or buying that special used piece of kit properly graded and checked when we want to go quirky or old school. Check them out using the special links and 5% discount or bonus code in the video description below. Thank you, KEH. In this episode, we are most certainly spoiled for choice, as the Brits would say. I am, however, reminded of my friend Nino Rakicevic's mentor, Tomislav Pedernek, who told him decades ago that sometimes the best photos are the ones directly behind you. I think it is important in life to look behind you, not to see the best images, the best photograph, but to gain perspective, to see multiple realities beyond one's own immediate boundaries. And too often when I do that, as I marvel at my own good fortune, the plethora of opportunities presented to me, the number of choices I have, I see too many people who have no choices at all. Just thought I'd throw a little perspective in there. Hey everybody, I'm Hugh Brownstone for Three Blind Men and an Elephant, and no newsflash, the demand for Leica's $6,200 Q3 outstrips the company's ability to supply them. At least for now. I don't know when this will change, but what I can tell you is this. For those of us so inclined and have the means, it's worth it. From street to travel, landscape, environmental portrait, photojournalism, basically anything and everything that doesn't demand interchangeable lenses or long-form video, it is an unparalleled photographic companion. I was very fortunate to be able to buy one early on. But as far as buying a second one goes, because although I thought it was going to be mine as soon as it arrived, Claudia promptly claimed it as her own, forget about it. No Q3 from me anytime soon. That's not entirely true. Well, not getting one anytime soon is true, but Claudia is not stingy about that or anything else really, and has consistently said I can borrow the Q3 anytime. But I just don't trust myself when it comes to the concept of borrowing her Q3. And unlike me, she did sell her personal kit immediately, the excellent Nikon Z7 II and outstanding Nikkor Z24-72.8 to, to help defray the cost of acquiring the Q3. I, on the other hand, have not yet been able to bring myself to sell my SL2. Which tells you something about each of us and both cameras, in particular the Q3, from the perspective of someone, I'm not talking about myself now, I'm talking about Claudia, who couldn't care less about specifications and instead immediately, instinctively, grasped what the Q3 could do for her that her Nikon kit could not, and then went out and did it. Hold that thought. In any case, water under the bridge, it's all good. That is, until earlier this month, months after sending in our application, we learned that we'd successfully registered for public tours of both the White House and the Capitol building down in Washington, D.C. The problem was this. It was only upon reading the fine print that we learned no interchangeable lens cameras are allowed in the White House. Even cameras with an integrated lens are not allowed if that lens is longer than three inches. So, no Leica SL2 for me, no Leica M11 for me, no Sony A7R5 for me, no Lumix S5 II for me. And while our iPhones, any recent smartphone for that matter, are fine for most things, low light interior shots without flash are not a strong suit for any of them in my experience. Claudia, on the other hand, was set with her Q3, which was perfect for it, especially with the addition of hybrid phase detection autofocus, a first for Leica. Meanwhile, I couldn't find a Q3 anywhere, not even one to borrow. But I was able to snag a very short-term Q2 monochrome loaner from Leica. Thank you, guys. And now we were ready for DC.
Two days after we returned home, we were back on the streets of New York, same kit, Claudia with her Q3, me with the borrowed Q2 monochrome, due back a day or two later. And it just got better. We loved both cues. The compact size and weight are revelatory on the street, no need for even a sling. But there are significant differences between them, and in those differences there are opportunities, so let's get into it. Now, to reiterate, both cameras are superb. Which one works better for you, of course, depends on what you value and prioritize. What both cameras share is this. one. That brilliant image stabilized Sumilux 28 1.7, which has no problem handling all 60 megapixels of the Q3. In fact, what led me to buy the Q3 with our own hard cash was shooting the same scene in Lower Manhattan with the Q3 and my SL2 with the Apo Sumicron SL35 F2 attached. It's my favorite lens of all time. 
only to see under eye-popping magnification that once punched into, say, a 50 millimeter field of view, I really couldn't see the difference between them. Two, the Q3 and Q2 monochrome both share the same industrial design and build quality, essentially the same body save for tilty screen and knock-on effects like relocated function buttons. Three, approximately the same size and weight. Four, the excellent Leica menu system. Five, the very same useful IP52 rating for moisture and dust resistance. Six, the same battery compartment and single card slot, although in either case without the internal memory that the M11 does have, and that would be quite nice. Seven, compatibility with a much improved, as in faster and more reliably connecting like a photos app. Eight, superb image quality from both sensors, irrespective of resolution and the absence or presence of a bare color filter array. And nine, suboptimal optional grips. Hold that thought. But here's how they are different. The Q3 offers, one, that higher resolution color sensor. Two, hybrid phase detection autofocus, which works really, really well. Three, that articulating rear screen. Four, an even better EVF. All of these matter greatly to me personally. Five, a USB-C port for data transfer and power delivery also matters to me. Six, a higher capacity battery and more efficient circuitry also matters to me. Seven, as I mentioned but did not detail, relocated main buttons from the left side of the rear fascia to the right side due to the articulating screen. Neither here nor there for me. Eight, one additional function button. Okay. Nine, 8K video recording. Okay. 10, a Qi charging compatible grip that the Q2 doesn't have because the Q2 doesn't do Qi charging, although both suffer the same defects, as in no Arca Swiss foot. That really surprised me because it looks like it's there. And the battery and card compartments are not accessible. And 11, a lower price. The Q3 is $59.95 compared to $61.95 for the Q2 monochrome. Although for the moment, this difference is irrelevant given the Q3's order backlog. The Q2 monochrome, on the other hand, offers this. One, it's available. Two, used in like new minus condition, a Q2 monochrome at KEH is selling for just about 5,400 bucks, a cool $800 less than a new Q2 monochrome, $600 less than a new Q3. Again, if you can even find a Q3 these days and you can't. Three, and this is really interesting, straight out of camera, the Q2 monochrome offers what to my eye is medium format film tonality. This will appeal to some of us, but not all of us. To more than a few of us, it will simply look like a lower contrast rendering and mean a little more work in post. To others, it will be astounding to see a very filmic medium format look in a camera so small, light, fast, and maneuverable. I'd call this tonality, this subtle gradation, revelatory as well. Four, better high ISO performance when not equalized for object size. Although when I do equalize for object size, I still prefer the resolution advantage of the Q3's 60 megapixels. I also rarely shoot at such high ISOs that the difference would be meaningful to me. And the latest denoise algorithms in like Lightroom, for example, are stunningly good. But with these advantages, the Q2 monochrome suffers from two less obvious disadvantages one of which I have yet to hear anyone else mention. First, because there is no color data, there is no ability to use color channel information in post. This is a real limitation for me personally, not only for editing, but because it means I may have to futz with filters. Not my thing for many, many years now, as those of you who know me know. But second, the biggest surprise of all is that, for the moment anyway, Adobe's generative fill and generative expand, just introduced into their production release of Photoshop, don't work with monochrome cameras. To my utter astonishment, this has, in a matter of weeks, become a huge limitation. Again, for me personally. I think once you go generative AI, you can't go back. And I am not talking about putting things into a frame nearly so much as I am talking about taking things out of a frame. But what does all of this mean for you? Well, let's repeat what I said at the outset. Either one of these cues is a killer camera. They are a joy in hand, small, light, unobtrusive, and capable of astounding image quality, full stop. The Q3, however, is more flexible in my book because of the color filter array and higher megapixel count. 
it is more likely to make better use of its resolution by dint of its superior hybrid phase detection autofocus, especially in low contrast conditions, where it performs as well as or better than, maybe, the Panasonic Lumix S52 series, a result of the L-squared partnership with Panasonic, including a new processor and autofocus algorithms. The Q3 is more enjoyable to use, again from my perspective, because of the larger higher-res EVF, most especially because of the tilty screen, meaning less bending or squatting. Oy vey. The Q3 is easier to use. Again, for me, there is simply less futzing owing to the USB-C port. The bare color array eliminates the need for color filters in front of the lens, as I mentioned earlier. More efficient circuitry and the higher output battery help to reduce capacity anxiety. Although the new battery will fit in the Q2, work with the Q2, and I'm sure will be certified to work with the Q2 shortly. And again, the tilty screen means less squatting. And also, once again, say it with me now, the Q3 is marginally less expensive than the Q2 monochrome new. But right the Q2 monochrome can be had for less by go and use. It does have that monochrome medium format look. All else being equal, the monochrome offers better high ISO noise performance when not equalized for object size. The rear button layout is more consistent with the M11 and SL2 series cameras. It is ever so slightly stealthier than the Q3, although it's easy enough to cover the Leica logo with a bit of black tape, or as we do, use one of those little adhesive dots, which covers it pretty much perfectly. Finally, if you are at all like me, any monochrome camera can serve as a creative whack on the side of the head that comes from the limitations of a monochrome only sensor. The bottom line is, as I so often say, yes, it's about the gear, but no, it's not about the gear, it's about the people. In this case, you. The use cases for both cameras are the same. So it comes down to how futz avoidant you are, just how far you want to crop an image, just how committed you are to monochrome per se, rather than black and white, because either camera will get you to a beautiful place in black and white if you are in a beautiful place here, however you choose to define beauty. But this just wouldn't be a three blind men and an elephant joint if I didn't mention that one, a regular Q2 with lens and body identical to the Q2 monochrome, including the IP rating EVF and 47 and megapixel resolution can be had new in the form of the Leica Q2 digital camera travel kit for $57.95, including an extra battery, which would normally be another 285 bucks and you will want one. Just 4,600 in like new condition from KEH though, without the extra battery. Two, an original 24 megapixel Q, the Type 116, again with the same lens and almost the same body as the Q2. It has a lower resolution EVF and there are more buttons on the rear. Can be had in like new minus condition, again from KEH for about 3,100 bucks. Three, an original QP, which Claudia recently used in Europe where she first fell in love with the Q series. Identical to the original Q, save for that lovely top plate engraving, can be had in excellent plus condition from KEH for 4,000. Although to my way of thinking, the sweet spot among used Qs is the Q2 with its greater resolution, improved weather sealing, improved EVF, and latest generation ergos. But hey, your mileage may vary, and as always, that's fine. And that is kind of that. Although, yeah, okay. What are we up to? Four? Four. Sony's just released $3,000, 60 megapixel A7CR offers interchangeable lenses that no Q-series does, and if not remotely as enjoyable in hand or to the eye, although it has a much lower sync speed because the Q-series has leaf shutter, cannot be denied as an extraordinary value with the best autofocus in the business, courtesy of its A7R5 guts. And finally, five, if you own, say, an iPhone 14 Pro, never mind the just announced 15 Pro Max or the two other camera lens modules on board either one, you already have the smartphone industry's answer to the entire Q series, an integrated 48 megapixel camera module when shooting raw with dedicated 24 millimeter full frame equivalent field of view and simulated depth of field, which can go shallower than any Q courtesy of computational imaging, although Forget about the limitations of computational imaging, the tiny sensor's poor low light performance, a phone's terrible camera ergos, the absence of an EVF altogether, blah, 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 for free. Just saying.
A big shout out to KEH for sponsoring this video. A great resource for finding just this kind of gear. Check them out using the special links and 5% discount or bonus code in the video description below. Thank you, KEH. If you like what you've seen here today, please give a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, join the conversation in the comments section below because this is an exceptional audience. If you'd like help with a portfolio review, gear selection, finding or honing your artistic voice, sign up for a one-on-one -on -one mentoring video call via Zoom at 3bmep.com slash booking. Finally, please consider supporting our work by using the no cost you affiliate links down below, sending us coffee money via PayPal, or most especially joining us on Patreon links down below as well. However you choose to support us, as always, we thank you for